For most of human experience, we lived in societies where past, present, and future was about the same. But a couple of hundred years ago, we began to live in worlds where there was such rapid change that people became uncertain. We are moving into an era of technological change that is well beyond anything we ever had before. Would that be okay? The water crisis isn't a thing of tomorrow, it's a thing of today. Every country needs to think about their water resources today. Part of me feels that self-driving is impossible, but things that I think are impossible are happening today. If we are using media to create multiple and competing social realities, then we are imperiling the future of what counts as a fact. What jobs are going to be safe? What are machines not going to be able to do? What's going to be left for humans to do? I have four kids. They need to learn a different trade. The future of work the future of water. The future of food. The future of driving. The future of meat. The future of fact. You should not assume it's going to be the way it has been. The tsunamis are coming. The waves are coming. They're rushing in faster than we can make a decision about what's good for us and what's bad for us. We can either ignore them and be wiped away, or we can become a surfer, study them, and surf them. The worst thing you can do right now is nothing. Don't be the guy who refuses to look at the future. New water restrictions have been imposed in Cape Town, South Africa. In India, rising temperatures threaten to make a severe water crisis there even worse. The greatest global risks of our time, the shortage of water. By 2050, the United Nations says more than 5 billion people could be facing water shortages across the globe. Normal is gone because populations around the world have grown so large. Normal is gone because humans are now changing the climate and we're in a completely new set of conditions and environments and extreme events. You can look at water problems and easily work yourself into a panic. We're talking about 95% of the population is actually living today in a country that has less water than it did 20 years ago. Take the nation of Namibia in the southwest corner of Africa. It's named for the Namib Desert, which is one of the oldest deserts on Earth. So this may seem like a weird place to come looking for the future of water. There are no running rivers within Namibia. They're only on our borders. So we're always in a state of uncertainty with our water supply. So this is probably the worst place to have a major city built on. And yet Namibia's capital, Windhoek, isn't dying of thirst. Windhoek found a radical source of water that's abundant and available to a city of any size, no matter how dry. Here, you'll find a facility with a unique mission. There was just simply not enough water from the sources around Windhoek. They looked at what do we have? We have a lot of wastewater. Water reclamation. We basically drink our wastewater, our shitty water, sorry to say, but yeah. While many cities usually just clean up sewage and then dump it into a river, Windhoek takes that treated water and sends it into their water recycling plant. There's a system of tanks and pipes where any leftover solid matter gets filtered out, microorganisms are killed off, and even antibiotics and hormones get broken down. The last step involves an ultrafiltration membrane. Which will filter out basically all suspended particles, all bacteria and all viruses. Then it's mixed with other treated water that's collected from an underground aquifer or reservoirs for seasonal rain. Which means that every time someone in Windhoek opens a tap, about a quarter of what comes out is recycled wastewater. It is both miraculous in one sense that you can have disgusting water that you shouldn't be drinking that is completely unhealthy for you. But at the same time, it's just H2O. And if you take everything around that H2O away, then you end up with pure water again. The system is monitored around the clock 
and the water is continually tested, both in the facility and in samples sent to independent labs. We do tests for every four hours. I'm sure, I know I'm the one who produced this water. I know the quality of this water, so I trust my own product. We cannot afford to lose the trust of the people drinking the water, and that is not uh, people far away. That starts with my family, with my friends. So we can't afford to even slip up once, because if we messed up once, we're out of the business. I say cheers. Building that trust means contending with an understandable aversion to dirty water. When a cholera epidemic broke out in London's Soho neighborhood in 1854, British scientist John Snow paved the way for the modern field of epidemiology by tracing the outbreak to a tainted well. So it's not surprising that the dangers of mixing drinking water and wastewater are feared. There's thousands of years of history packed into that resistance, and that has served us well. But we need to add this idea that water can be cleaned. You can use it, it's dirty, clean it up, use it again. And this technology isn't something newfangled that people living in Windhoek recently had to accept. Namibians have been drinking recycled water for the past half century. Windhoek took this giant leap forward because in the 1950s, they nearly ran out of water and had to ration it. Those people, have they grown horns or are they funny looking, you know? Are they still normal? There are no health outbreaks, no epidemics or something that happened as a result of our reuse directly. There's nothing. In the end, it came down to the point, it's this or nothing. So it was a matter of survival. Since the plant was first opened, Windhoek has faced more droughts and that's led to more demand that even more water be recycled. It's always been that sort of saving grace. So once the community actually accepted it, they now rely on that to bring them through tough periods. Since Windhoek's adopted this technology, a handful of other cities have embraced drinking their recycled wastewater. But in other places, this technology has been met with resistance. Toilet water is toilet water. Um, damn water, I don't think, has been toilet water ever. It's toilet water. Do I look like a dog or something? I'm not drinking no toilet water. But while Windhoek might seem extreme in how it handles its wastewater, it's likely that many people are already drinking some wastewater. Everybody lives downstream of somebody. There is a wastewater pipe put into the Mississippi River every eight miles from Minneapolis to New Orleans. So everybody downstream of Minneapolis is pulling water out that 10 or 20 or 40 other cities have used. So that idea of pure water, everyone likes to think that they're drinking pure water, but it's just because you simply don't know what you are drinking. As water gets scarcer, Windhoek is looking at the more expensive and energy-intensive option of pumping desalinated water from the coast to the inland city. But the city is also emphasizing something else conservation. In her home, Mayday Thomas closed off all the taps except for the shower head. Instead of letting water run freely from the taps while they cook or clean, they fill a 20-liter bucket and take water from there. When you open a tap, it doesn't tell you that you've opened two liters or five liters of 20 liters. We've experienced droughts, say, 2013 and then now 2016. Who says there's not going to be another drought the next two years or next three years? And watching how much water you use becomes even more critical when you go to the shanty towns on the outskirts of Vinthook that rely on communal taps. And in some of the newer settlements, they're still waiting for those taps to be built. The same day that those people fill up the tank is the same day the water runs out. Shali Eminent DeMario says his section of the neighborhood relies on a tank that's only filled sporadically. You have to save water each and every time. You have to make sure that there's water for tomorrow. Even in Windhoek, it's the more affluent neighborhoods that use up a higher percentage of water. Sometimes on things like sun-exposed pools and lush gardens. 
If you've never experienced water scarcity or water shortage, obviously you won't think about the water because your system is like that. You open the tap and it's there. It's not just water from the tap. That's not the source of water. The developed world has lived through what I think of as about a century of the golden age of water. People never thought about it. It was unthinkingly clean and safe, it was unlimited, and it was essentially free. The problem is that that whole system is invisible, and we aren't living in the golden age of water anymore. As more places across the globe start to feel the pressure of dwindling access to fresh water, what Vinhook can teach us is that dealing with this problem takes innovative technology. But just as importantly, it'll take thinking about water way before we turn on a tap, and long after it goes down the drain. In the end, our global water problems, as severe and real as they are, aren't going to be solved at the global level. They're going to be solved at the individual level by decisions we make about the appliances we buy and the kinds of gardens we plant. It's going to be solved at the community level by decisions about how we manage our stormwater and our local streams and our local rivers. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Many other cities and countries have gone through this. The future has arrived in some of them, and we can learn from their future for our future. One slice of New York cheesecake. Why is it in so many of the sci-fi movies? Breakfast of Champions. Food of the future comes out of a gadget. Hydrate level four, please. But if you really want to understand the future of food, it's probably not gadgets you should be paying attention to. People who make raising food their business say the biggest challenges coming involve how food is grown. We're kind of a throwback to a different era. This South Dakota farm looks old school, but the Ortman family has designed it around their vision for the future. Better to embrace change on your own terms than wait until it embraces you by force. <laughs> Several years ago, the Ortmans began rebuilding their operation from the dirt up after realizing that they were barely breaking even, focusing on a conventional crop of mainly corn. Amen. My conclusion after pushing the numbers on this was that going organic was going to work better economically because of the organic price premiums. Yeah, I was still gathering eggs from her. This wasn't rooted in some kind of dream or wish or some philosophy. It really did start with economics. Switching from conventional farming to organic was a huge change. Instead of plowing and spraying to kill weeds, the Ortmans make multiple trips through fields to carefully scrape them out. Instead of fertilizing with chemicals, they spend months preparing one of the oldest tools in agriculture. Our operation is really built around compost. We're talking about manure here. For these farmers, all that effort is worth it. Because for them, the future of food has a lot to do with the future of dirt. If you boil down food production into its most basic form, everything that we eat comes off of the soil, originally. And the soil is a living organism. We tend to take the soil for granted. That's the ultimate source of most of our food. History holds lessons for societies that fail to keep soil in mind. If you look at the history of the spread of Western civilization, it's in many regards a story of people moving on after degrading the land. Individual droughts or political events or war with the neighbors. Those kind of events are the kind of things that will actually sort of take down civilizations. But the table is set, if you will, by the state of the land. One of the reasons this is so important, climate change. Farmers will feel the impacts in their fields long before we feel the impacts in the grocery stores. The trends are all towards extremes. Rain doesn't come gradually throughout the year anymore. It comes in fewer but larger doses that the land is just not able to soak up. Will says he's found that minimally tilled land enriched with organic material like compost 
tends to soak up more rain and stay moist through dry spells. Other growers have found still more dramatic solutions. This indoor vegetable farm in New Jersey has eliminated dirt entirely and recreated climate from scratch. We grow in warehouses without sun or soil, independent of the seasons, independent of the weather, and this is how we can take back what's becoming more and more challenging with climate change. Another vulnerability could be the conventional farming model practiced across the United States. It tends to favor large operations that specialize in just a few crops or animals. This monoculture agriculture, which we tend to have had, is so vulnerable to weather changes and climate and pests. You know, if, if a disease were to wipe out the wheat crop worldwide, it would have potentially devastating, catastrophic impacts globally, everywhere. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. I'm just saying that a good farmer has got to be a good risk manager. The Ortmans manage their risk by spreading it out. They grow a variety of crops like corn, rye, black beans, soy, and strawberries. And they also raise cattle and chickens that lay eggs. That's exactly like a stock portfolio. Not very many people have all of their holdings in one stock. Small organic farms may be one part of the solution to the challenges the future holds. But in a world whose population is heading north of 9 billion people, it's probably not the only solution. That's because the human race will consume more food in the next 50 years than it has in the past 10,000 years combined. It's a complicated problem, but it is a problem that the human race can deal with. We're going to need everything from traditional agriculture to exotic agriculture. Everything from industrial agriculture to locally scaled agriculture. And we've got to remember that overlying it all is the consumer. And the consumer is king and queen. And they ultimately will decide what they're going to eat and therefore what the future of agriculture is going to look like. Feeding the future will require us to grow a lot more food but it'll probably also require us to waste a lot less. We throw away about 35% of all food that we produce. That's both here in the United States and elsewhere. That is low-hanging fruit. That is almost enough if we could figure out a way to deal with that problem, to feed people over the next couple of decades. So in our little corner of the world, we're doing what we can to enrich our soil to diversify. I hope people can see that, that the land is responding to what we're doing. I hope people can see that we're not starving, that we're doing okay financially, knock on wood. And the Ortmans believe their operation could hold affordable lessons for improving resiliency in the developing world countries where farms are small and populations are large. It's not going to be a gadget that'll do it. There's a constant exchange of ideas and of experiences. I don't want my kids to say, there are all these warning signs when I was a kid and my dad just looked the other way and now look at what we have to deal with. This is the ark we're building before the rain. Eric Kroom is a logger who's betting everything he has on the future. If this project is just a huge failure, it just means that I'm back to uh, hand to mouth. It's everything that I got. Besides cutting trees, Eric Kroom is also a self-taught engineer. And he's spending all his money to build and send machines where they've never tread before. So in the past, that machine, a machine like that, has never come up a hill like that. They don't have like many American industries, logging has been swept by a wave of automation. But steep mountainsides have remained a last refuge for people on the ground working with their hands. Until now. So if you had two hand cutters cutting and a seven-man rigging crew, that's nine people with at least six or seven of them on the ground, this is replacing those people directly. Understanding how automation is playing out in this industry can teach us a lot about the future of work far from the woods. 
While some of the benefits may be surprising, the pain will hit close to home. Eric's son Tristan does a job that Eric plans to automate. After the trees come down, Tristan is one of the workers attaching cables by hand to haul logs off the mountainside. And he said his colleagues see what's coming. Almost half probably just think their job's getting stolen. In that way, what's happening on these Oregon slopes could soon happen all over. The machines may soon replace many of us. The traditional logging that we're all used to is over. Nobody can compete with the latest technology, not if you're doing it the old way. People studying how automation transforms employment generally agree that a vast swath of jobs will soon dramatically change or disappear. Probably in the last five years or so, we've seen these technologies make more progress than they've made in the last 50 years, especially the artificial intelligence part. The worst predictions say 40% of today's jobs could be lost to automation in only a few decades. But if even half of that manifests, we're talking about a question of fundamentally restructuring what American life looks like. It isn't the first time we've seen lives fundamentally restructured by machines. In 19th century England, an economic recession and changing fashions and a wave of automation threw thousands of textile makers out of well-paid jobs. The workers who reacted by violently smashing machinery came to be known as Luddites. The people that became the Luddites, the croppers, the weavers, um, they were the middle class of that day. And that's one of the reasons why they reacted so strongly when automation and machinery came along to take those jobs away, because they were falling from a pretty high height. We're talking about change that, that in a matter of a few years wiped out tons and tons of jobs. And so that makes you think about today. After the British government stamped out the Luddite movement, the textile industry continued to automate unabated. And some students of history say the Luddite's core grievance wasn't really about machines at all. So they were comfortable with machinery. They'd been using tools for years. If technology was going to be used in a way that benefited everyone, they were happy with it. They saw this really not as a technological fight, but an economic fight. When the Luddites started breaking machines, it was because they had lost their attempt to mitigate the way that economic change would happen. Today, technologists say heavy economic change is coming to jobs that involve mind as much as muscle. The same way that Google Maps slashed the mental calculations needed to navigate around town, new systems could soon automate the judgment calls once needed to do stuff like prepare tax returns or parse legal precedent or make a medical diagnosis. I think that's what makes this time different. So many of us imagine that a lot of things that require emotional intelligence are inherently human, uh, judgment, intuition, uh, those are the things that are inherently human, where historically we've never really needed power tools for those things. And it's likely that many people who never considered their work a candidate for automation will see artificial intelligence change their jobs in big ways. We actually found in our research is that something like 60% of occupations have on average about 30% of the activities that can be automated. What that means is that you can have probably more people working with machines alongside machines. So it's kind of becomes this collaboration, this fluid kind of like a exchange of talents between the machines and the people. How can I help you? From the discovery of fire all the way to having a pen with which we write, I mean, we always have invented tools. The eye is another tool. The eye did not come from the sky. And here's where it's probably worth underscoring, one of the biggest lessons the loggers may hold for the rest of us. Sure, automation is gonna lead to less work for guys like this. But it will also lead to less of something else. If you have a man on a chainsaw falling trees, they're eventually going to get hurt. You're the softest thing out here. If you face an accident, you're either gonna be disabled or you're gonna be dead. Logging has the highest death rate of any American occupation. For its size, logging kills people at a higher rate than the military. So sadly, uh, yesterday a hand cutter got killed. It was pretty local. That really brings it home with what we're doing. That could be one of my guys. I've come to the belief that 
The only way I can ensure the safety of my people is not have them there. The best way not to kill a hand cutter is not have one. We can't stop the automation coming to the woods, and we probably shouldn't want to. The stakes may not be as high for the algorithms automating work elsewhere, but there are likely to be ways that the technology coming to your workplace will one day seem similarly indispensable. To the extent that automation is destroying either routine, uninteresting, dangerous, hazardous work, that may be a good thing. Uh, and also hopefully creating other kinds of work. Uh, and, and, and the economy has is, is, is done that for decades. One of the things that gets lost in the um, conversation about automation is that there are actually enormous benefits to us as a society. The challenge remains dealing with the whirlwind pace at which our era's technologies are entering and remaking our jobs. I've been cutting timber for 22, 23 years. I have four kids. They need to learn a different trade. So what will the future of work look like? From here, it looks like a future where careers could become a changing story of not one job, but many. The majority of people will end up having an episodic career. It's great to ask kids, for example, what do you want to be when you grow up? But one thing that might be added to that question is, what five things do you want to be when you grow up? You're probably not going to do the same job you did when you were 20. You're probably not going to do the same job for 40 years. The world is moving too fast right now. The worst thing you can do right now is nothing. Don't be the guy who refuses to look at the future. It's been said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But magicians have secrets to their tricks. Self-driving cars aren't a thing of the future. They are here. Following news about self-driving cars, it's hard to know what to think. They're inevitable. Driverless cars could be on the streets as soon as April. They're impossible. I'm here to promise you <laughs> that driverless cars will never happen. They're a punchline. No steering wheel means the commute will be so much more efficient when we can give each other both middle fingers. And even some researchers in autonomous vehicles are on the fence. I have to confess, like, I'm actually really torn because part of me feels that self-driving is impossible. But things that I think are impossible are happening today. What's the sort of secret behind that? It turns out there is a secret of sorts, and it's been hiding in plain sight for much of the three decades John Leonard has spent researching robotics. And to understand this secret, it helps to look at a more recent problem Leonard has taken on, preparing his son, Matthew, for the Massachusetts driver's test. Inch your way out. Make sure you can see both ways. Oh, wait, wait, there's a car coming from the right. If it's been a while since you've learned, it may be easy to forget how much work driving takes to master. Does it look good? Um, I think so, yeah. Go for it. Even in a residential neighborhood, there's some chaos on the road, and reacting correctly is how you stay safe. Be very careful here because it's not wide enough for two cars. Matt is getting the hang of it because modeling a chaotic world in real time is a task humans have evolved to handle well. Teaching machines to do this is a harder problem. And scientists have been working on this problem for decades. In 2004, teams of engineers from all over the country entered a government-sponsored race to get a car from California to Nevada without a driver. This was really a revolutionary idea at the time. Uh, it was really unclear whether or not a vehicle would be capable of doing that. Matthew Johnson Robertson was part of a heavily favored team from Carnegie Mellon University. But heavily favored didn't turn out to mean winning. Their vehicle only made it seven miles, farther than any other car, but it ended up getting stuck and catching fire. Not a single car in the race made it to the finish. So when they held another race in 2005, DARPA made some key changes. They realized that this sort of completely unstructured, kind of completely open-ended off-road race was really very, very difficult. And so what they did is they built um, sort of GPS waypoints that were more constrained, they made the terrain more benign, made it easier for the cars to finish. In 2007, many of the same crews took on a more difficult urban course in a race where John Leonard led MIT's team. For me, the, the urban challenge was like 
my Woodstock of robotics. It was really uh, the sort of pivotal moment of that decade in robotics. This was a remarkable uh, transition from uh, a notion that was considered science fiction to something that seemed to be feasible. In both events, it may have looked like the cars were driving just like we do. But rather than model the world in real time, the successful teams relied on an essential shortcut that wasn't necessarily obvious from the outside. One of the things that the teams there that did the best used were very high definition maps, sort of breadcrumb trails. So even though you can't see it, it's almost as if there are virtual railroad tracks that the robot is driving along. It's not like real sort of rails in the road, but the positioning in effect gives the robot this sort of virtual track to follow. And in the years since 2007, autonomous vehicle technology has gotten better, but the hype has gotten even bigger. Self-driving will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200% um, safer than a person by the end of next year. Driverless cars are the cars of the future. But veterans of the effort to teach cars to drive themselves are striking a much more cautious tone. I am not saying it's impossible. I am just saying it's going to be a long, slow slog to get there. And it'll be step by step. We know it's going to start with simpler environments and then gradually advance to more complicated environments. We can see some of the industry's first simple steps in a suburb outside of Phoenix, Arizona. A corporate offshoot of Google called Waymo has outfitted a fleet of minivan taxis that are piloting themselves and their passengers around town. It's very cool, as you can imagine. You call it with an app on your phone, just like uh, an Uber or a Lyft. Uh, it shows up, the door opens, and you can press the big button that says start ride. And then you kind of sit back, you look at this screen that's on like the back of the front seats, and it kind of shows you what the car sees. But what's happening in Chandler, Arizona, also demonstrates how far the current technology is from the robot chauffeurs we once predicted. I think when we were kids, we might have thought that someday there would be a literal robot sitting in the front seat of a car wearing their chauffeur cap, taking you from point A to point B. That's not what we have today. Well, there are cars without drivers in certain areas. You see people in the driver's seat in most Waymo cars ready to take over. But getting rid of safety drivers entirely and getting these cars in more places will require a few critical shortcuts or hacks to cut down on the chaos of driving in the wild. And those hacks look a lot like the ones that made the DARPA challenges work. We can only drive in places that we've already built a map. And so for a car from us to appear on your block, we need to have built a map of your block. And Waymo's maps are almost unthinkably more precise than the consumer grade maps on your phone, which means they take a lot of time and money to build. Our maps have, down to about 15 centimeters, the location of every curb, stop sign, traffic light, driveway. And in some sense, people might say, oh, that seems like you're cheating, but it's not. Uh, we want to give the car every advantage we can to make the problem tractable. And that's not the only problem. To make it work, they had to cut down on the chaos of real-life driving. Remember the DARPA challenges? It's no accident they took place in controlled courses and sunny locations where chaotic traffic or bad weather wouldn't overload the vehicle's systems. And these suburbs of Phoenix offer very similar advantages to Waymo. If it's snowing, your sensors are not gonna work as well. Your laser scanner is gonna give false readings. Your camera's not gonna see as well. If you were to suddenly cover the world with snow, then now that map of what the road surface looks like doesn't match the world. So it's like losing your rails. A critical part of working as well as we do is being selective in what we attempt to drive. We are not driving in the dense uh, traffic of Mumbai, uh, where you have really hairy traffic situations. We are not yet driving in the worst blizzard that you can imagine. Bad weather is just one example of how real-world chaos can make self-driving cars lose their virtual rails. Streets choked with heavy traffic, pedestrians, and bikes also pose problems for the software controlling these cars. And the stakes can be high if things go wrong. Think of the software that we use on our ordinary desktop computers. We've all encountered the blue screen of death, but if it's the computer that's driving your car, it's a lot more than a figure of speech. You really could die. In the U.S. since 2016, at least four people have died in fatal accidents where authorities said autonomous software was either engaged or fully controlling the car during the crash. And the more we use autonomous software in transportation, the more lives will depend on it working well. 
Which leads to one of the most fundamental questions about this technology. Will it be safer than us? We're actually incredibly safe drivers as human beings. And so one of the things that's hard to think about is that there's this massive number of fatalities, but it's because we drive a massive amount as Americans. And some researchers say it will be a long time before autonomous vehicles will be as safe as people. Despite industry claims about the safety benefits of self-driving cars, there's limited federal oversight and not enough independently gathered data to back up their claims. Right now we have almost nothing in the public record about how the cars actually work, what software is powering them, how that software was trained in the case of artificial intelligence, um, how good the performance actually is for any of the companies. Several leading companies have begun toning down their predictions about the imminent arrival of driverless technology. And even engineers at Waymo acknowledge the difficulty of the road ahead. We are continuing to work on the software. Next, we need to build maps. It's certainly going to be a lot of work. And then finally, we need to convince people that this is something they want and that is responsible. In some ways, even today's most advanced vehicles are still struggling with problems engineers ran up against in those early DARPA challenges. The gap between what was accomplished then, what needs to be accomplished for fully automated driving on public roads under different weather conditions, lighting conditions, traffic conditions, that gap is big. But along the way, there will be multiple benefits from these technologies getting into vehicles. And we are seeing benefits from the technology getting into vehicles on the street today. It's helping human drivers be better drivers with features like auto parking, lane assist, blind spot warnings. Your car will just get like a little bit smarter through time. It will take over more of the tasks that suck. You know, long haul driving, uh, parking the car itself. Like all these things are available in some form, but they'll get better and better and better. And it will make it harder and harder for you to crash the car. These are things that, you know, are really a continuation of a very, very long path towards safer cars. that Americans love the hamburger. But now, scientists are trying to cancel beef. The Impossible Whopper is now Alternative meat is a hot commodity. That patty is 100% plant-based protein. No, no way. But there's more to it than just its beefy taste. Meat takes an enormous toll on natural resources in the environment. Under the current system, it's not sustainable. It has to change. While the new plant-based meats may be high-tech, the ideas behind them have been around for decades. Choosing a plant diet you can both help yourself and change the world all at the same time. So much of what we do is in that book. You know, it was written there, but it takes that long for it to get into mainstream dialogue. Hello. What's happening? Ethan Brown started his alternative meat company, Beyond Meat, in 2009 with a radical idea. You don't need an animal to make meat. So this is the, the 2.0 version, which hasn't been released yet, right? If we can make it so it tastes and delights just like animal protein, very few consumers are going to say, no, nah, I just don't want to do that. Brown wants Beyond to play a role in the fight against climate change. It's excellent. Very good. You know, for a long time I worked in the energy sector, spending all of my career in this area, but not really focusing on that main problem. And that main problem is really livestock. Cattle, especially in feedlots, emit dangerous amounts of greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide. Our farming methods, agriculture, land use, deforestation are contributing substantially to the climate crisis. Because cows consume large amounts of grain, rising global meat consumption means increased exploitation of land and water. According to the United Nations, nearly 80% of the world's agricultural land is used to graze or grow food for livestock. We've known about the resource-intense nature of agriculture. We've known about its implications in climate. We've known about the health implications of consumption of, of high levels of animal protein. And we've, of course, known about the you know, conditions that animals are raised in, in, in industrial agriculture. And every day we work away at solving for those problems by focusing on one thing, transitioning the protein that's sent to the plate from an animal-based protein to a plant-based protein. That's it. At Beyond Meat's lab, they study every detail hoping to replicate the taste, 
texture, aroma, and even the sizzle of meat. The product we're best known for is the Beyond Burger, and we spent years actually working toward getting it to the point where a mainstream consumer would say, yeah, that's a really meat-like experience for me. It's delivering the protein I need, it's satiating, et cetera. Companies like Beyond want consumers to consider the social and environmental impact of the food they eat. But while their products are new, this idea that an individual's choice to eat less meat can benefit the world is not. It was first introduced by a young author, Francis Moore LePay, 50 years ago. Francis Moore LePay, author of the popular bestseller Diet for a Small Planet. In 1971, when she published Diet for a Small Planet, take a new hard look at the problem of hunger in America the world was facing a hunger crisis. Even though we are growing more grain on this planet, there are many more mouths to feed. The world was obsessed with feeding people, and I thought, ah, if I could just understand why people are hungry. Conventional wisdom said we were reaching the Earth's capacity to produce food. But Moore LePay, who was only 27 years old, buried herself in data about global production. It is the original manuscript for Diet for a Small Planet. Dated January 6, 1971. I just said, okay, I'm going to figure out, are we really at the Earth's limits? Is that really the cause of hunger? So these are all the calculations that I did with little line rulers. And so I got my dad's slide rule, and I just, just sat there hour after hour, literally putting two and two together. What she discovered astounded her. If all the world's grain was fed to people, there would be plenty to eat. There's more than enough for us all. If you take, as I did very simply, you take the world food supply and you divide it by the number of people on the planet, more, more than enough. But we were feeding much of what we grew to cattle, which were remarkably inefficient at making meat. In one chart, Moore LePay illustrated how 21 pounds of protein fed to a cow made just one pound of protein for people. What I wanted to get across is that uh, our current food system is inefficient, unjust, illogical, and destructive. You know, that, that it's just not, we can do a lot better and we need not have hunger. Her solution, a meat-free diet, was in the beef-loving 1970s. They're the beef people. So alien, the publisher asked her to include recipes showing options for meat-free meals. I wanted to encourage people that, hey, we can be part of the solution because I think we want to have meaning in our lives and it feels good if we can align our daily choices with something larger. Has it helped people change their diets? Are people changing their diets? Oh, definitely. I think it has been a jumping off point for many people. Despite little media attention, Diet for a Small Planet became a counterculture bestseller, inspiring readers with the message that everyday choices and individual actions could make a difference. One of them was a young environmentalist, Seth Tibbet. I read that book and I became a vegetarian. In 1980, he started a business in Forest Grove, Oregon, the Turtle Island Soy Dairy, which made some of the first alternative meats from a soy protein called tempeh. This was the first ad that I created for Turtle Island tempeh, and you see I have the Soy tempeh, good old soy, and five grain tempeh, which was right out of the pages of Diet for a Small Planet. And then the soy tempeh with herbs was my temperoni. Even though he was barely breaking even, in 1995, Tibbert introduced a new product for Thanksgiving. It was called Tofurky. Nobody thought it was a good idea. They said, that's a stupid name, that's silly. Do you have any Tofurky? Tofurky? Yeah, tofu turkey. Tofurky, anyone? Is this tofurky? Tofurky. Tobagel. With cream to cheese. Tofurky. tofurky. We had no ad budget, but what we did have going for us was this quirky product with this quirky name, and we started finding that the media just couldn't get enough of it. He made other products too, like tofu sausages and deli slices. After decades of slow but steady growth, about two years ago, demand for Tofurky's products suddenly exploded. The conversation for us changed from 
where in the world are we going to sell all this product that we are set up to make to how in the world are we going to make enough to meet the demand of this new industry? While the shift seems quick, it's also something animal rights activists have been working toward for decades. I read Diet for a Small Planet in 1987, and it blew my mind. Like Seth Tibbet, Bruce Friedrich stopped eating meat after reading Diet for a Small Planet. But he eventually grew to believe it was unethical to eat animals at all. He became an animal rights advocate and tried everything from throwing fake blood on fur coats to farm animal rescue to get people to stop eating meat. I spent a whole bunch of time focused on individual dietary change. So educating people about who farm animals are, and yet year after year after year since then, per capita meat consumption has gone up. So he switched from activism to capitalism and started a trade group that finds investors for alternative meat. To build market share, he says it's essential to be mainstream, working with venture capitalists, fast food restaurants, and even meat companies. The market sector is everybody who eats, so the market opportunity for investors, regardless of whether they care about the ethics, uh, it's hard to imagine anything more colossal. If all we do is continue to do the same sort of um, farm activism that we've been doing for decades, we're not gonna make progress. That approach, shared by both Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, seems to be working. In May of 2019, Beyond Meat had one of the best performing public offerings by a major U.S. company in the past two decades. Growing like crazy, the opportunities keep coming to us, and step by step, you're sort of wearing down the barriers to this idea that existed even just 10 years ago. I think we've absolutely benefited from all the marketing efforts of our, our peer companies, um, which is great. I mean, they're, they're rising the tide. Seth Tibbetts' stepson, Jamie Athos, who is now Tofurky's CEO, says plant-based eating has made this shift from counterculture to mainstream. He points to sales trends from the past two years. If you look at real animal meat sales, they're like more or less flat. If you look at meat alternative sales, they grew by about 37 or 38 percent. So that's how a revolution happens, that kind of growth rate. In zero percent beef, we know. He also credits savvy marketing and a new generation of consumers, influenced by social media and awareness of climate change and animal welfare. It's going nationwide. Maybe you think it's cool to be a plant-based eater. It's kind of on trend right now. I think I'm pretty optimistic about people in general, but it's nice to be surprised in that direction, that society could shift so quickly. Frances Moore LePay's daughter, Anna LePay, agrees. She's a food writer and environmental activist who, a decade ago, wrote a book exploring food's impact on climate. I was at a, a food tech conference in San Francisco a few months back, and it was so amazing to me how almost every single pitch began with what sounded like the beginning of a Francis Moore LePay speech about the environment and sustainability. But she believes her mother has always wanted more than for people to just give up meat. She was never that simplistic. It's really not having a conversation about what we want our plate to look like. It's more, what do we want our world to look like? To me, that Diet for a Small Planet message is ultimately this, this message about democracy. Who is making that choice that we should take this vast amount of, of land that could be feeding people directly and turn it over to be growing feed for livestock in a way that's ultimately so inefficient? Both Anna and her mother have concerns about the new meat alternatives. They worry that even if they do lead to less grain consumption or are more humane for animals, many are heavily processed. They would also like to know more about how the plants that go into them are grown. Any message that reinforces the idea that somehow you have to buy a packaged product in order to eat in the plant world is, is not helpful. One of the core principles of eating a climate-friendly diet is eating as much real food as possible, so not processed food. I think the question should be not just, is something meat or is it not meat, but were pesticides used, toxic pesticides, were synthetic fertilizers that are incredibly energy intensive to produce. All of these questions go into essentially understanding what is the impact of the food we're eating. There's Angie. As for Frances Moore LePay herself, 
she's having a renaissance. She's in demand as a speaker and, along with Anna, is preparing a 50th anniversary edition of Diet for a Small Planet. There's been enormous change in our culture around food since I wrote my book. Just enormous change. <laughs> People often ask me, wasn't it hard to give up meat? And I say, no, it was so exciting. This was about foundational change and a system that was really um, destructive and not serving us. It was very much about finding our voice and having power and to make in some small way some difference in the world. Welcome. Suit up sequence initiated. Biometric signature required. Virtual and augmented reality platforms are sweeping the world of gaming. There are games that go deep and create richly immersive virtual worlds. And there are games that go wide, augmenting the real world and making the game appear anywhere you go. In 2016 alone, about $2.3 billion in investment poured into companies working on virtual and augmented reality platforms. For some, it's a bet that the technology is poised to cross the threshold from toy to tool. Turning the world into a screen may sound like a dystopia to some. They called our generation the missing millions. But backers of the technology say there could be something irresistible in a device that displays facts you need to know right when you need to know them, right before your eyes. So many things that we now have anxiety around about our interaction with the physical world will just stop being an issue. You're at a water park and you don't know where your child is. With a wearable device, you can see them through buildings, through anywhere, they're over here, they're over there. And what about more complex facts? Some journalists say immersive storytelling could be a powerful way to capture attention of news audiences so they don't just think about events, but experience them. How am I going to stay relevant and get you to care about stories that are on the other side of the world that you've started to block out? I look at these immersive storytelling platforms as the next step in the evolution of journalism. Uh, uh, One of the most straightforward methods simply allows viewers to look around. On a rooftop above Fallujah, an Iraqi sniper takes careful aim at an ISIS soldier. When the New York Times' Ben Solomon rode along with Iraqi special forces liberating Fallujah in 2016, he took a 360-degree camera. The result was a mix of war reporting that you'd see on TV, alongside moments of something unmistakably new. These are the cells where ISIS would hold their prisoners. As the door shuts, the freedom to direct your own gaze emphasizes the confinement of the space in a way that a fixed perspective just can't. The fact here is something you feel. So as a journalist, you're always trying to give people what Martha Gellhorn called the view from the ground. But with virtual reality now, I'm asking my audience to do something much more intense. I'm asking them to be on scene, to take me out of the picture and become the witness themselves. Nani de la Pena and her collaborators are going further than 360 video creating densely researched projects that let viewers explore a street bombed in Syria or fly above a melting glacier in Greenland. We use Google Maps, we use photographs, we use video. We're very thorough and very careful to use the real source material to inform what we build. All that material helps recreate experiences like this one with Frontline, which takes viewers inside a solitary confinement cell alongside a man who spent years living in one. So, you know, I would, uh take blood and I'll write messages all over myself, you know, help me. The screen disappears. You're no longer separated from the material that you're looking at. You're inside the story. And that gives you this incredible feeling of presence, a feeling like your whole body is on scene and then you're witnessing an event as it really unfolds around you. I uh, cut myself thousands of times just over and over and over and over. 
This immersive project, created by conflict photographer Kareem Ben Khalifa, is even more interactive. It draws on interviews with fighters on opposite sides of conflicts in Israel and Palestine, El Salvador, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The project, called The Enemy, transforms the source material into digital avatars of each man. They can appear in an entirely virtual space or inside your living room with the aid of a phone. It doesn't feel seamlessly real, but it's still gripping to share their space and listen to them as their eyes follow you around the room. When you listen to those fighters, you realize what they've been through, how much hope they still have, how much uh, uh, humanity they still carry. When people go in, they know those fighters exist. They even have a memory of having met those fighters once they come out from there. And I can see some people are very emotional when they leave this, uh, this experience. But some critics worry that more emotion may be the last thing we need in news. Today, faith in the press has eroded at the same time new platforms enable new ways to push our buttons with fake news stories, videos that can make anyone say anything, and outlets that whip up feelings to reinforce particular points of view. If a fake Facebook post can trick you now, imagine what an immersive storytelling piece could do to you, right? The moment at which our bodies and our minds really believe we are someplace else, that is an experience that really threatens deliberation and judgment. One bad scenario is that everything becomes even more about confirmation bias and people will just completely disconnect from anybody who doesn't already agree with them. If we are using media to create multiple and competing social realities, then we are imperiling the future of what counts as a fact. Whether you're talking about screens that replace reality entirely or ones that simply augment what you're seeing everywhere, what feels new here is the degree to which this form of communication could short-circuit judgment by getting right in your face. Yet there are precedents for this. There are certain things that, that have a particular ability to capture our attention. And, you know, today that's the screen, but the first iteration was the poster. The poster, when it came out, was a sensation, especially in the late 19th century in France, where they started using bright colors, moving images, sexy women. People were astonished. They, they couldn't believe this thing. They said, you know, it controls the mind. It, it's, it's out of control. There's still pretty strenuous laws, even in New York City, as to where you can have posters. That's why there aren't that many eye-level posters in New York. You may not realize that. They're usually up. Uh, it's because they, they ban posters being right in your face all times. People worry that, that if we're giving people an embodied experience, that it's a subjective experience, and it can't have the transparency and the authenticity that journalism has before it. VR will be used for propaganda. It'll be used badly for journalism. Uh, it'll be used for incredible films. But that's always going to be about who's the maker, and it's not about the medium. And that could mean that the best defense we have against manipulated facts on immersive platforms may well be the same non-technological defenses we've been using all along. When misinformation comes, journalists need to be there to be like, okay, you know me, you know me, you can trust me, you know my track record, you know my credibility, you know my history, you know my values and what I stand for. That is fake, that is real. Every information technology comes with this twin possibility of greater education information, the greater capacity to manipulate and deceive. The technology it takes to seize people's attention and make them pay attention to facts has always been a double-edged sword. And it seems every era's next layer of innovation ends up making that sword a little bit bigger. So, you know, once upon a time, the persuaders we're basically out on the street in posters, maybe the town crier. <laughs> then it slowly moved into the house that was radio and the television. Then it came closer to us with the phone and the computer screen. Now the future is one where maybe it's all over your body, even close to your eyeballs, maybe plugged into your brain. <laughs> you know, so it's getting closer and closer and closer to us. So where is the future of fact in this medium? We're just barely getting a glimpse of what it's going to look like.